Here are four examples to illustrate this point. 1. What gives real estate value? A highly successful realtor who specializes in rural property shows what can be done if we train ourselves to see something where little or nothing presently exists. Most of the rural property around here, my friend began, is run down and not very attractive. I'm successful because I don't try to sell my prospects a farm as it is. I develop my entire sales plan around what the farm can be. Simply telling the prospect, the farm has XX acres of bottomland and XX acres of woods and is XX miles from town, doesn't stir him up and make him want to buy it. But when you show him a concrete plan for doing something with the farm, he's just about sold. Here, let me show you what I mean. He opened his briefcase and pulled out a file. This farm, he said, is a new listing with us. It's like a lot of them. It's 43 miles from the center of the metropolitan area. The house is run down, and the place hasn't been farmed in five years. Now here's what I've done. I spent two full days on the place last week, just studying it. I walked over the place several times. I looked at neighboring farms. I studied the location of the farm with respect to existing and planned highways. I asked myself, what's this farm good for? I came up with three possibilities. Here they are. He showed them to me. Each plan was neatly typed and looked quite comprehensive. One plan suggested converting the farm into a riding stable. The plan showed why the idea was sound. A growing city, more love for the outdoors, more money for recreation, good roads. The plan also showed how the farm could support a sizable number of horses so that the revenue from the rides would be largely clear. The whole riding stable idea was very thorough, very convincing. The plan was so clear and convincing, I could see a dozen couples riding horseback through the trees. In similar fashion, this enterprising salesman developed a second thorough plan for a tree farm and a third plan for a combination tree and poultry farm. Now, when I talk with my prospects, I won't have to convince them that the farm is a good buy as it is. I help them to see a picture of the farm changed into a money-making proposition. Besides selling more farms and selling them faster, my method of selling the property for what it can be pays off in another way. I can sell a farm at a higher price than my competitors. People naturally pay more for acreage and an idea than they do for just acreage. Because of this, more people want to list their farms with me and my commission on each sale is larger. The moral is this. Look at things not as they are, but as they can be. Visualization adds value to everything. A big thinker always visualizes what can be done in the future. He isn't stuck with the present. 2. How much is a customer worth? A department store executive was addressing a conference of merchandise managers. She was saying, I may be a little old-fashioned, but I belong to the school that believes the best way to get customers to come back is to give them friendly, courteous service. One day I was walking through our store when I overheard a salesperson arguing with a customer. The customer left in quite a huff. Afterward, the salesperson said to another, I'm not going to let a $1.98 customer take up all my time and make me take the store apart trying to find him what he wants. He's simply not worth it. I walked away, the executive continued, but I couldn't get that remark out of my mind. It is pretty serious, I thought, when our salespeople think of customers as being in the $1.98 category. I decided right then that this concept must be changed. When I got back to my office, I called our research director and asked him to find out how much the average customer spent in our store last year. The figure he came up with surprised even me. According to our research director's careful calculation, the typical customer spent $362 in our establishment. The next thing I did was call a meeting of all supervisory personnel and explain the incident to them. Then I showed them what a customer is really worth. 
Once I got these people to see that a customer is not to be valued on a single sale, but rather on an annual basis, customer service definitely improved. The point made by the retailing executive applies to any kind of business. It's repeat business that makes the profit. Often there's no profit at all on the first several sales. Look at the potential expenditures of the customers, not just what they buy today. Putting a big value on customers is what converts them into big regular patrons. Attaching little value to customers sends them elsewhere. A student related this pertinent incident to me, explaining why he'll never again eat in a certain cafeteria. For lunch one day, the student began, I decided to try a new cafeteria that had just opened a couple of weeks before. Nickels and dimes are pretty important to me right now, so I watch what I buy pretty closely. Walking past the meat section, I saw some turkey and dressing that looked pretty good, and it was plainly marked 39 cents. When I got to the cash register, the checker looked at my tray and said, a dollar nine. I politely asked her to check it again because my tally was 99 cents. After giving me a mean glare, she recounted. The difference turned out to be the turkey. She had charged me 49 cents instead of 39 cents. Then I called her attention to the sign which read 39 cents. This really set her off. I don't care what that sign says. It's supposed to be 49 cents. See? Here's my price list for today. Somebody back there made a mistake. You'll have to pay the 49 cents. Then I tried to explain to her the only reason I selected the turkey was because it was 39 cents. If it had been marked 49 cents, I'd have taken something else. To this, her answer was, you'll just have to pay the 49 cents. I did because I didn't want to stand there and create a scene, but I decided on the spot that I'd never eat there again. I spend about $250 a year for lunches, and you can be sure they'll not get one penny of it. There's an example of the little view. The checker saw one thin dime, not the potential $250. 3. The Case of the Blind Milkman It's surprising how people sometimes are blind to potential. A few years ago, a young milkman came to our door to solicit our dairy business. I explained to him that we already had milk delivery service and we were quite satisfied. Then I suggested that he stop next door and talk to the lady there. To this he replied, I've already talked to the lady next door, but they use only one quart of milk every two days, and that's not enough to make it worthwhile for me to stop. That may be, I said, but when you talked to our neighbor, did you not observe that the demand for milk in that household will increase considerably in a month or so? There will be a new addition over there that will consume lots of milk. The young man looked for a moment like he had been struck, and then he said, How blind can a guy be? Today, that same one quart every two days family buys seven quarts every two days from a milkman who had some foresight. That first youngster, a boy, now has two brothers and one sister, and I'm told there'll be another young one soon. How blind can we be? See what can be, not just what is. The school teacher who thinks of Jimmy only as he is, an ill-mannered, backward, uncouth brat, certainly will not aid Jimmy's development. But the teacher who sees Jimmy not as he is now, but as he can be, she'll get results. Most folks driving through Skid Row see only broken down stumble bums hopelessly lost to the bottle. A few devoted people see something else in the Skid Rowite. They see a reconstructed citizen. And because they see this, they succeed in many cases in doing an excellent rehabilitation job. 4. What determines how much you're worth? After a training session a few weeks ago, a young man came to see me and asked if he could talk with me for a few minutes. I knew that this young fellow, now about 26, had been a very underprivileged child. On top of this, he had experienced a mountain of misfortune in his early adult years. 
I also knew that he was making a real effort to prepare himself for a solid future. Over coffee, we quickly worked out his technical problem, and our discussion turned to how people who have few physical possessions should look toward the future. His comments provide a straightforward, sound answer. I've got less than $200 in the bank. My job as a rate clerk doesn't pay much, and it doesn't carry much responsibility. My car is four years old, and my wife and I live in a cramped second-floor apartment. But, Professor, he continued, I'm determined not to let what I haven't got stop me. That was an intriguing statement, so I urged him to explain. It's this way, he went on. I've been analyzing people a lot lately, and I've noticed this. People who don't have much look at themselves as they are now. That's all they see. They don't see a future. They just see a miserable present. My neighbor is a good example. He's continually complaining about having a low-paid job, the plumbing that's always getting fouled up, the lucky breaks somebody else just got, the doctor bills that are piling up. He reminds himself so often that he's poor that now he just assumes that he's always going to be poor. He acts as if he were sentenced to living in that broken-down apartment all the rest of his life. My friend was really speaking from the heart, and after a moment's pause, he added, If I looked at myself strictly as I am, old car, low income, cheap apartment, and hamburger diet, I couldn't help but be discouraged. I'd see a nobody, and I'd be a nobody for the rest of my life. I've made up my mind to look at myself as the person I'm going to be in a few short years. I see myself not as a rate clerk, but as an executive. I don't see a crummy apartment. I see a fine new suburban home. And when I look at myself that way, I feel bigger and think bigger. And I've got plenty of personal experiences to prove it's paying off. Isn't that a splendid plan for adding value to oneself? This young fellow is on the expressway to really fine living. He's mastered this basic success principle. It isn't what one has that's important. Rather, it's how much one is planning to get that counts. The price tag the world puts on us is just about identical to the one we put on ourselves. Here is how you can develop your power to see what can be, not just what is. I call these the practice adding value exercises. 1. Practice adding value to things. Remember the real estate example. Ask yourself, what can I do to add value to this room or this house or this business? Look for ideas to make things worth more. A thing, whether it be a vacant lot, a house, or a business, has value in proportion to the ideas for using it. 2. Practice adding value to people. As you move higher and higher in the world of success, more and more of your job becomes people development. Ask, what can I do to add value to my subordinates? What can I do to help them to become more effective? Remember, to bring out the best in a person, you must first visualize his best. 3. Practice adding value to yourself. Conduct a daily interview with yourself. Ask, what can I do to make myself more valuable today? Visualize yourself not as you are, but as you can be. Then specific ways for attaining your potential value will suggest themselves. Just try and see. A retired owner-manager of a medium-sized printing company, 60 employees, explained to me how his successor was picked. Five years ago, my friend began, I needed an accountant to head up our accounting and office routine. The fellow I hired was named Harry and was only 26. He knew nothing about the printing business, but his record showed he was a good accountant. Yet, a year and a half ago, when I retired, we made him president and general manager of the company. Looking back on it, Harry had one trait that put him out in front of everyone else. Harry was sincerely and actively interested in the whole company, not just writing checks and keeping records. Whenever he saw how he could help other employees, he jumped right in. 
The first year Harry was with me, we lost a few men. Harry came to me with a fringe benefit program which he promised would cut down turnover at low cost. And it worked. Harry did many other things too, which helped the whole company, not just this department. He made a detailed cost study of our production department and showed me how a $30,000 investment in new machinery would pay off. Once we experienced a pretty bad sales slump, Harry went to our sales manager and said, in effect, I don't know much about the sales end of the business, but let me try to help. And he did. Harry came up with several good ideas, which helped us sell more jobs. When a new employee joined us, Harry was right there to help the fellow get comfortable. Harry took a real interest in the entire operation. When I retired, Harry was the only logical person to take over. But don't misunderstand, my friend continued. Harry didn't try to put himself over on me. He wasn't a mere meddler. He wasn't aggressive in a negative way. He didn't stab people in the back, and he didn't go around giving orders. He just went around helping. Harry simply acted as if everything in the company affected him. He made company business his business. We can all learn a lesson from Harry. The I'm doing my job and that's enough attitude is small, negative thinking. Big thinkers see themselves as members of a team effort, as winning or losing with the team, not by themselves. They help in every way they can, even when there is no direct and immediate compensation or other reward. The fellow who shrugs off a problem outside his own department with the comment, well, that's no concern of mine, let them worry about it, hasn't got the attitude it takes for top leadership. Practice this. Practice being a big thinker. See the company's interest as identical with your own. Probably only a very few persons working in large companies have a sincere, unselfish interest in their company. But after all, only a relatively few persons qualify as big thinkers, and these few are the ones eventually rewarded with the most responsible, best-paying jobs. Many, many potentially powerful people let petty, small, insignificant things block their way to achievement. Let's look at four examples. 1. What does it take to make a good speech? Just about everyone wishes he had the ability to do a first-class job of speaking in public. But most people don't get their wish. Most folks are lousy public speakers. Why? The reason is simple. Most people concentrate on the small, trivial things of speaking at the expense of the big, important things. In preparing to give a talk, most people give themselves a host of mental instructions, like, I've got to remember to stand straight. Don't move around and don't use your hands. Don't let the audience see you use your notes. Remember, don't make mistakes in grammar. Especially, don't say, for he and I. Say, for him and me. Be sure your tie is straight. Speak loud, but not too loud. And so on and so on. Now, what happens when the speaker gets up to speak? He's scared because he's given himself a terrific list of things not to do. He gets confused in his talk and finds himself silently asking, Have I made a mistake? He is, in brief, a flop. He's a flop because he concentrated on the petty, trivial, relatively unimportant qualities of a good speaker and failed to concentrate on the big things that make a good speaker. Knowledge of what he's going to talk about and an intense desire to tell it to other people. The real test of a speaker is not did he stand straight or did he make any mistakes in grammar, but rather did the audience get the points he wanted to put across. Most of our top speakers have petty defects. Some of them even have unpleasant voices. Some of the most sought-after speakers in America would flunk a speech course taught by the old negative, don't do this and don't do that method. Yet all these successful public speakers have one thing in common. They have something to say, and they feel a burning desire for other people to hear it. Don't let concern with trivia keep you from speaking successfully in public. 2. 
What causes quarrels? Ever stop to ask yourself just what causes quarrels? At least 99% of the time, quarrels start over petty, unimportant matters like this. John comes home a little tired, a little on edge. Dinner doesn't exactly please him, so he turns up his nose and complains. Joan's day wasn't perfect either, so she rallies to her own defense with, Well, what do you expect on my food budget? Or... Maybe I could cook better if I had a new stove like everybody else. This insults John's pride, so he attacks with, Now, Joan, it's not lack of money. It's simply that you don't know how to manage. And away they go. Before a truce is finally declared, all sorts of accusations are made by each party. In-laws, sex, money, premarital and postmarital promises, and other issues will be introduced. Both parties leave the battle nervous, tense. Nothing has been settled, and both parties have new ammunition to make the next quarrel more vicious. Little things, petty thinking, causes arguments. So, to eliminate quarrels, eliminate petty thinking. Here's a technique that works. Before complaining or accusing or reprimanding someone or launching a counterattack in self-defense, ask yourself, is it really important? In most cases, it isn't, and you avoid conflict. Ask yourself, is it really important if he or she is messy with cigarettes or forgets to put the cap on the toothpaste or is late coming home? Is it really important if he or she squandered a little money or invited some people in I don't like? When you feel like taking negative action, ask yourself, is it really important? That question works magic in building a finer home situation. It works at the office, too. It works in homegoing traffic when another driver cuts in ahead of you. It works in any situation in life that is apt to produce quarrels. 3. John got the smallest office and fizzled out. Several years ago, I observed small thinking about an office assignment destroy a young fellow's chances for a profitable career in advertising. Four young executives, all on the same status level, were moved into new offices. Three of the offices were identical in size and decoration. The fourth was smaller and less elaborate. J.M. was assigned the fourth office. This turned out to be a real blow to his pride. Immediately, he felt discriminated against. Negative thinking, resentment, bitterness, jealousy built up. J.M. began to feel inadequate. The result was that J.M. grew hostile toward his fellow executives. Rather than cooperate, he did his best to undermine their efforts. Things got worse. Three months later, J.M. slipped so badly that management had no choice but to issue him a pink slip. Small thinking over a very small matter stopped J.M. In his haste to feel he was discriminated against, J.M. failed to observe that the company was expanding rapidly and office space was at a premium. He didn't stop to consider the possibility that the executive who made the office assignments didn't even know which one was the smallest. No one in the organization except J.M. regarded his office as an index of his value. Small thinking about unimportant things, like seeing your name last on the department root sheet or getting the fourth carbon of an office memo, can hurt you. Think big, and none of these little things can hold you back. 4. Even stuttering is a detail. A sales executive told me how even stuttering is a mere detail in salesmanship if the fellow has the really important qualities. I have a friend, also a sales executive, who loves to play practical jokes, though sometimes these jokes aren't jokes at all. A few months ago, a young fellow called on my practical joking friend and asked for a sales job. The fellow had a terrible stutter, though, and my friend decided right here was a chance to play a joke on me. So the friend told the stammering applicant that he wasn't in the market for a salesman right now, but one of his friends, me, had a spot to fill. Then he phoned me, and boy did he give this fellow a build-up. Not suspecting anything, I said, send him right over. 
30 minutes later, in he walked. The young fellow hadn't said three words before I knew why my friend was so eager to send him over. I, I, I'm J -J -J Jack R., he said. Mr. X sent me over t -t to talk t -t to you about a j -j job. Almost every word was a struggle. I thought to myself, this guy couldn't sell a dollar bill for 90 cents on Wall Street. I was sore at my friend, but I really felt sorry for this fellow, so I thought the least I could do was to ask him some polite questions while I thought up a good excuse as to why I couldn't use him. As we talked on, however, I discovered this fellow was no stoop. He was intelligent. He handled himself very nicely, but I just couldn't overlook the fact that he stuttered. Finally, I decided I'd wind up the interview by asking one last question. What makes you think you can sell? Well, he said, I learn f f fast, I, I, I like people, I, I think you've got a good company, and I, I want t to make m money. Now, I, I do have a speech Im Im impairment, but, but that doesn't b bother me, so why should it b bother anybody else? His answer showed me he had all the really important qualifications for a salesman. I decided right then to give him a chance. And you know, he's working out very well. Even a speech impairment in a talker's profession is a triviality if the person has the big qualities. Practice these three procedures to help yourself think about trivialities. 1. Keep your eyes focused on the big objective. Many times, we're like the salesman who, failing to make the sale, reports to his manager, yes, but I sure convinced the customer he was wrong. In selling, the big objective is winning sales, not arguments. In marriage, the big objective is peace, happiness, tranquility. Not winning quarrels or saying, I could have told you so. In working with employees, the big objective is developing their full potential, not making issues out of their minor errors. In living with neighbors, the big objective is mutual respect and friendship, not seeing if you can have their dog impounded because once in a while it barks at night. Paraphrasing some military lingo, it is much better to lose a battle and win the war than to win a battle and lose the war. Resolve to keep your eyes on the big ball. 2. Ask, is it really important? Before becoming negatively excited, just ask yourself, is it important enough for me to get all worked up about? There is no better way to avoid frustration over petty matters than to use this medicine. At least 90% of quarrels and feuds would never take place if we just faced troublesome situations with, is this really important? 3. Don't fall into the triviality trap. In making speeches, solving problems, counseling employees, think of those things that really matter, things that make the difference. Don't become submerged under surface issues. Concentrate on important things. Take this test to measure the size of your thinking. Here listed are several common situations of how petty thinkers and big thinkers see the same situation. Check yourself, then decide which will get me where I want to go, petty thinking or big thinking. The same situation handled in two entirely different ways. The choice is yours. Situation, expense accounts. The petty thinker's approach figures out ways to increase income through chiseling on expense accounts. The big thinker's approach figures out ways to increase income by selling more merchandise. Situation, conversation. The petty thinker's approach talks about the negative qualities of his friends, the economy, his company, the competition. The big thinker's approach talks about the positive qualities of his friends, his company, the competition. Progress. Believes in retrenchment or, at best, the status quo. Or, believes in expansion. Future. Views the future as limited. Or, sees the future as very promising. 
Work looks for ways to avoid work or looks for more ways and things to do, especially helping others. Competition competes with the average or competes with the best. Budget problems figures out ways to save money by cutting down on necessary items or figures out ways to increase income and buy more of the necessary items. Goals sets goals low or sets goals high. Goals vision sees only the short run or is preoccupied with the long run. Security is preoccupied with security problems or regards security as a natural companion of success. Companionship surrounds himself with petty thinkers or surrounds himself with persons with large progressive ideas. Mistakes magnifies minor errors, turns them into big issues, or ignores errors of little consequence. Remember, it pays in every way to think big. 1. Don't sell yourself short. Conquer the crime of self-deprecation. Concentrate on your assets. You're better than you think you are. 2. Use the big thinker's vocabulary. Use big, bright, cheerful words. Use words that promise victory, hope, happiness, pleasure. Avoid words that create unpleasant images of failure, defeat, grief. 3. Stretch your vision. See what can be, not just what is. Practice adding value to things, to people, and to yourself. 4. Get the big view of your job. Think, really think, your present job is important. That next promotion depends mostly on how you think toward your present job. 5. Think above trivial things. Focus your attention on big objectives. Before getting involved in a petty matter, ask yourself, is it really important? Grow big by thinking big. Chapter 5. How to Think and Dream Creatively First, let's clear up a common fallacy about the meaning of creative thinking. For some illogical reason, science, engineering, art, and writing got tabbed as about the only truly creative pursuits. Most people associate creative thinking with things like the discovery of electricity or a polio vaccine, or the writing of a novel, or the development of color television. Certainly, accomplishments like these are evidence of creative thinking. Each forward step made in the conquest of space is the result of creative thinking, lots of it. But creative thinking is not reserved for certain occupations, nor is it restricted to super-intelligent people. Well then, what is creative thinking? A low-income family devises a plan to send their son to a leading university. That's creative thinking. A family turns the street's most undesirable lot into the neighborhood beauty spot. That's creative thinking. A minister develops a plan that doubles his Sunday evening attendance. That's creative thinking. Figuring out ways to simplify record-keeping, selling the impossible customer, keeping the children occupied constructively, making employees really like their work, or preventing a certain quarrel. All of these are examples of practical, everyday creative thinking. Creative thinking is simply finding new improved ways to do anything. The rewards of all types of success, success in the home, at work, in the community, hinge on finding ways to do things better. Now, let's see what we can do to develop and strengthen our creative thinking ability. Step 1. Believe it can be done. Here is a basic truth. To do anything, we must first believe it can be done. Believing something can be done sets the mind in motion to find a way to do it. To illustrate this point of creative thinking in training sessions, I often use this example. I ask the group, 
How many of you feel it is possible to eliminate jails within the next 30 years? Invariably, the group looks bewildered, not quite sure they heard right, and thinking they are listening to a real fuzz brain. So, after a pause, I repeat, how many of you feel it is possible to eliminate jails within the next 30 years? Once they're sure I'm not joking, someone always blasts me with something like, you mean to say you want to turn all those murderers, thieves, and rapists loose? Don't you realize what this would mean? Why none of us would be safe? We have to have jails. Then the others cut loose. All order would break down if we didn't have jails. Some people are born criminals. If anything, we need more jails. Did you read in this morning's paper about that murder? And the group goes on telling me all sorts of good reasons why we must have jails. One fellow even suggested we've got to have jails so the police and prison guards can have jobs. After about ten minutes of letting the group prove why we can't eliminate the need for jails, I say to them, Now, let me mention here that this question of eliminating jails is used to make a point. Each of you has come up with reasons why we can't eliminate the need for jails. Will you do me a favor? Will you try extra hard for a few minutes to believe we can eliminate jails? Joining in the spirit of the experiment, the group says, in effect, Oh well, but just for kicks. Then I ask, Now, assuming we can eliminate jails, how could we begin? Suggestions come slowly at first. Someone hesitantly says something like, well, you might cut down crime if you established more youth centers. Before long, the group, which ten minutes ago was solidly against the idea, now begins to work up real enthusiasm. Work to eliminate poverty. Most crime stems from the low income levels. Conduct research to spot potential criminals before they commit a crime. Develop surgical procedures to cure some kinds of criminals. Educate law enforcement personnel in positive methods of reform. These are just samples of the 78 specific ideas I've tabulated that could help accomplish the goal of eliminating jails. When you believe, your mind finds ways to do. This experiment has just one point. When you believe something is impossible, your mind goes to work for you to prove why. But when you believe, really believe something can be done, your mind goes to work for you and helps you find the ways to do it. Believing something can be done paves the way for creative solutions. Believing something can't be done is destructive thinking. This point applies to all situations, little and big. The political leaders who do not genuinely believe permanent world peace can be established will fail because their minds are closed to creative ways to bring about peace. The economists who believe business depressions are inevitable will not develop creative ways to beat the business cycle. In a similar fashion, you can find ways to like a person if you believe you can. You can discover solutions to personal problems if you believe you can. You can find a way to purchase that new larger home if you believe you can. Belief releases creative powers. Disbelief puts the brakes on. Believe and you'll start thinking constructively. Your mind will create a way if you let it. A little over two years ago, a young man asked me to help him find a job with more future. He was employed as a clerk in the credit department of a mail order company and felt that he was getting nowhere. We talked about his past record and what he wanted to do. After knowing something about him, I said, I admire you very much for wanting to move up the ladder to a better job and more responsibility. But getting a start in the kind of job you want requires a college degree these days. I notice you finished three semesters. May I suggest you finish college? Going summers, you can do it in two years. Then I'm sure you can land the job you want with the company you want to work for. I realize, he answered, that a college education would help. But it's impossible for me to go back to school. Impossible? Why? I asked. 
Well, for one thing, he began, I'm 24. On top of that, my wife and I are expecting our second child in a couple of months. We barely get by now on what I make. I wouldn't have time to study since I'd have to keep my job. It's just impossible, that's all. This young man really had himself convinced that finishing college was impossible. Then I said to him, If you believe it is impossible to finish school, then it is. But by the same token, if you'll just believe it is possible to return to the university, a solution will come. Now here's what I would like you to do. Make up your mind you are going to go back to school. Let that one thought dominate your thinking. Then think, really think, about how you can do it and still support your family. Come back in a couple of weeks and let me know what ideas you've come up with. My young friend returned two weeks later. I thought a lot about what you said, he began. I've decided I must go back to school. I haven't figured out all the angles yet, but I'll find a solution. And he did. He managed to get a scholarship provided by a trade association, which paid his tuition, books, and incidentals. He rearranged his work schedule so he could attend classes. His enthusiasm and the promise of a better life won him his wife's full support. Together, they creatively found ways to budget money and time more effectively. Last month, he received his degree one day and went to work the next as a management trainee for a large corporation. Where there's a will, there is a way. Believe it can be done. That's basic to creative thinking. Here are suggestions to help you develop creative power through belief. 1. Eliminate the word impossible from your thinking and speaking vocabularies. Impossible is a failure word. The thought, it's impossible, sets off a chain reaction of other thoughts to prove you're right. 2. Think of something you've been wanting to do but felt you couldn't. Now, make a list of reasons why you can do it. Many of us whip and defeat our desires simply because we concentrate on why we can't, when the only thing worthy of our mental concentration is why we can. Recently, I read a newspaper item that said there are too many counties in most states. The article pointed out that most county boundaries were established decades before the first automobile was built, and while the horse and buggy was the chief mode of travel. But today, with fast automobiles and good roads, there is no reason why three or four counties could not be combined. This would cut down greatly on duplicated services so that taxpayers would actually get better service for less money. The writer of this article said he thought he had stumbled across a really live idea, so he interviewed 30 people at random to get their reactions. The result? Not one person thought the idea had merit, even though it would provide them with better local government at less cost. That's an example of traditional thinking. The traditional thinker's mind is paralyzed. He reasons, it's been this way for a hundred years, Therefore, it must be good and must stay this way. Why risk a change? Average people have always resented progress. Many voiced a protest toward the automobile on the grounds that nature meant for us to walk or use horses. The airplane seemed drastic to many. Man had no right to enter the province reserved for birds. A lot of status quoers still insist that man has no business in space. One top missile expert recently gave an answer to this kind of thinking. Man belongs, says Dr. Von Braun, where man wants to go. Around 1900, a sales executive discovered a scientific principle of sales management. It received a lot of publicity and even found its way into textbooks. The principle was this. There is one best way to sell a product. Find the best way, then never deviate from it. Fortunately for this man's company, new leadership came in in time to save the organization from financial ruin. 
Contrast that experience with the philosophy of Crawford H. Greenwald, president of one of the nation's largest business organizations, E.I. DuPont de Nemours. In a talk at Columbia University, Mr. Greenwald said, There are many ways in which a good job can be done, as many ways, in fact, as there are men to whom the task is given. In truth, there is no one best way to do anything. There is no one best way to decorate an apartment, landscape a lawn, make a sale, rear a child, or cook a steak. There are as many best ways as there are creative minds. Nothing grows in ice. If we let tradition freeze our minds, new ideas can't sprout. Make this test sometime soon. Propose one of these ideas to someone and then watch his behavior. 1. The postal system, long a government monopoly, should be turned over to private enterprise. 2. Presidential elections should be held every two or six years instead of four. 3. Regular hours for retail stores should be 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. instead of 9 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. 4. The retirement age should be raised to 70. Whether these ideas are sound or practical is not the point. What is significant is how a person handles propositions like these. If he laughs at the idea and doesn't give it a second thought, and probably 95% will laugh at it, chances are he suffers from tradition paralysis. But the one in 20 who says, that's an interesting idea, tell me more about it, has a mind that's turned to creativity. Traditional thinking is personal enemy number one for the person who is interested in a creative personal success program. Traditional thinking freezes your mind, blocks your progress, and prevents you from developing creative power. Here are three ways to fight it. 1. Become receptive to ideas. Welcome new ideas. Destroy these thought repellents. Won't work. Can't be done. It's useless. And it's stupid. A very successful friend of mine who holds a major position with an insurance company said to me, I don't pretend to be the smartest guy in the business, but I think I am the best sponge in the insurance industry. I make it a point to soak up all the good ideas I can. 2. Be an experimental person. Break up fixed routines. Expose yourself to new restaurants, new books, new theaters, new friends. Take a different route to work someday. Take a different vacation this year. Do something new and different this weekend. If your work is in distribution, develop an interest in production, accounting, finance, and the other elements of business. This gives you breadth and prepares you for larger responsibilities. 3. Be progressive, not regressive. Not, that's the way we did it where I used to work, so we ought to do it that way here, but how can we do it better than we did it where I used to work? Not backward, regressive thinking, but forward, progressive thinking. Because you got up at 5.30 a.m. to deliver papers or milk the cows when you were a youngster doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea for you to require your children to do the same. Imagine what would happen to the Ford Motor Company if its management allowed itself to think, this year we've built the ultimate in automobiles. Further improvement is impossible. Therefore, all experimental engineering and designing activities are hereby permanently terminated. Even the mammoth Ford Motor Company would shrivel fast with this attitude. Successful people, like successful businesses, live with these questions. How can I improve the quality of my performance? How can I do better? Absolute perfection in all human undertakings, from building missiles to rearing children, is unattainable. This means there is endless room for improvement. Successful people know this, and they are always searching for a better way. Note, the successful person doesn't ask, can I do it better? He knows he can. So he phrases the question, how can I do it better? A few months ago, a former student of mine, in business for just four years, opened her fourth hardware store. 
This was quite a feat, considering the young lady's small initial capital investment of only $3,500, strong competition from other stores, and the relatively short time she had been in business. I visited her new store shortly after it opened to congratulate her on the fine progress she had made. In an indirect way, I asked her how she was able to make a success of three stores and open a fourth one, when most merchants had to struggle to make a success of just one store. Naturally, she answered, I worked hard, but just getting up early and working late isn't responsible for the four stores. Most people in my business work hard. The main thing I attribute my success to is my self-styled weekly improvement program. A weekly improvement program? Sounds impressive. How does it work? I asked. Well, it really isn't anything elaborate, she continued. It's just a plan to help me do a better job as each week rolls around. To keep my forward thinking on the track, I've divided my job into four elements. Customers, employees, merchandise, and promotion. All during the week, I make notes and jot down ideas as to how I can improve my business. Then, every Monday evening, I set aside four hours to review the ideas I've jotted down and figure out how to put the solid ones to use in the business. In this four-hour period, I force myself to take a hard look at my operation. I don't simply wish more customers would shop in my store. Instead, I ask myself, what can I do to attract more customers? How can I develop regular, loyal customers? She went on describing numerous little innovations that made her first three stores so successful. Things like the way she arranged the merchandise within her stores, her suggestion selling technique that sold two out of three customers merchandise they had not planned to buy when they entered her stores, the credit plan she devised when many of her customers were out of work because of a strike, the contest she developed that boosted sales during a slack season. I ask myself, what can I do to improve my merchandise offerings? And I get ideas. Let me cite just one case. Four weeks ago, it occurred to me that I should do something to get more youngsters into the store. I reasoned if I had something here to draw the kids to the store, I'd also draw more of the parents. I kept thinking about it, and then this idea came. Put in a line of small carded toys for children in the 4 to 8 age bracket. It's working. The toys take little space, and I make a nice profit on them. But most important, the toys have increased store traffic. Believe me, she went on, my weekly improvement plan works just by conscientiously asking myself how can I do a better job I find the answers it's a rare Monday night that I don't come up with some plan or technique that makes that profit and loss statement look better and I've learned something else too about successful merchandising something that I think every person going into business for himself should know what's that I asked just this it isn't so much what you know when you start that matters it's what you learn and put to use after you open your doors that counts most. Big success calls for persons who continually set higher standards for themselves and others. Persons who are searching for ways to increase efficiency, to get more output at lower cost, do more with less effort. Top success is reserved for the I can do it better kind of person. General Electric uses the slogan Progress is our most important product. Why not make progress your most important product? The I can do better philosophy works magic. When you ask yourself, how can I do better? Your creative power is switched on and ways for doing things better suggest themselves. <laughs>